Welcome to the Huberman Lab Podcast, where we discuss science and science-based tools for everyday life. I'm Andrew Huberman, and I'm a professor of neurobiology and ophthalmology at Stanford School of Medicine. Today, my guest is Dr. Wendy Suzuki. Dr. Suzuki is a professor of neuroscience and psychology at New York University and one of the leading researchers in the area of learning and memory. Her laboratory has contributed fundamental textbook understanding of how brain areas such as the hippocampus, which you will learn about today, how the hippocampus and related brain circuits allow us to take certain experiences and commit them to memory so that we can use that information in the future. Dr. Suzuki is also an expert public educator in the realm of science. A few years back, she had a TED Talk that essentially went viral. If you haven't seen it already, you should absolutely check it out in which she describes her experience using exercise as a way to enhance learning and memory. And on the basis of that personal experience, she reshaped her laboratory to explore how things like meditation, exercise, and other things that we can do with our physiology and our psychology can allow us to learn faster, to commit things to memory longer, and indeed to reshape our cognitive performance in a variety of settings. As such, I am delighted to announce that Dr. Suzuki is now not only running a laboratory at New York University, but she is the incoming Dean of Arts and Science at New York University. And of course, she was selected for that role for her many talents, but one of the important aspects of her program, she tells me, is going to be to incorporate the incredible power of exercise, meditation, and other behavioral practices for enhancing learning, for improving stress management, and other things to optimize student performance. Today, you are going to get access to much of that information so that you can apply those tools in your daily life as well. Dr. Suzuki is also an author of several important books. The most recent one is entitled Good Anxiety, Harnessing the Power of the Most Misunderstood Emotion, and a previous book entitled Healthy Brain, Happy Life, a personal program to activate your brain and do everything better. And while that is admittedly a very pop science type title, I will remind you that she is one of the preeminent memory researchers in the world and has been for quite a while. So the information that you'll glean from those books is both rich in depth and breadth and is highly applicable. By the end of today's discussion, you will have learned from Dr. Suzuki a large amount of knowledge about how memories are formed, how they are lost, and you will have a much larger kit of tools to apply for your efforts to learn better, to remember better, and to apply that information in the ways that best serve you. Before we begin, I'd like to emphasize that this podcast is separate from my teaching and research roles at Stanford. It is, however, part of my desire and effort to bring zero cost to consumer information about science and science-related tools to the general public. In keeping with that theme, I'd like to thank the sponsors of today's podcast. Our first sponsor is Athletic Greens. Athletic Greens is an all-in-one vitamin, mineral, probiotic drink. I've been taking Athletic Greens since 2012, so I'm delighted that they're sponsoring the podcast. The reason I started taking Athletic Greens and the reason I still take Athletic Greens once or twice a day is that it meets all my foundational vitamin, mineral, and probiotic needs. In fact, whenever people ask me if I were to only take one supplement, which supplement should I take? I tell them Athletic Greens for the simple reason that it covers your base of vitamins, minerals, and probiotics. It also has important adaptogens, digestive enzymes for gut health. All of this is very important because we now know that gut health and the so-called gut-brain axis is very important for things like mood and brain function and also contributes to immune system function. With Athletic Greens, you're covering all those bases. And of course, you need to eat the nutrition and healthy diet that's right for you. But by taking Athletic Greens once or twice a day, you can be sure that there are going to be no gaps or deficiencies in your vitamin, mineral, or probiotic needs. I mix mine with water and a little bit of lemon juice or lime juice. I personally find it delicious. If you'd like to try Athletic Greens, you can go to athleticgreens.com slash Huberman to claim a special offer. They'll give you five free travel packs plus a year's supply of vitamin D3K2, both of which are also vital for immediate and long-term health. So once again, if you go to athleticgreens.com slash Huberman, you can get a special offer of five free travel packs to make it easy to mix up Athletic Greens while you're in the car or otherwise traveling. Plus, they'll give you the year supply of vitamin D3, K2. Today's episode is also brought to us by Inside Tracker. Inside Tracker is a personalized nutrition platform that analyzes data from your blood and DNA to help you better understand your body and help you reach your health goals. I've long been a believer in getting regular blood work done. 
for the simple reason that many of the factors that impact your immediate and long-term health can only be analyzed from a quality blood test. And nowadays, with the advent of modern DNA tests, you can also get insight into, for instance, what your biological age is and compare that to your chronological age. And of course, your biological age is the, the number that really matters. With Inside Tracker, there's a distinct advantage. And the advantage is that while there are many blood tests and DNA tests out there, Inside Tracker's blood and DNA tests come also with a platform, meaning a website platform that allows you to see exactly what you could or should do in order to adjust the numbers on things like hormone levels, metabolic factors, and lipids, and so on. It's a little pop-up window. It points to nutritional, supplementation, and behavioral regimens that you can take in order to put those numbers in the ranges that are optimal for you. If you'd like to try Inside Tracker, you can visit insidetracker.com slash Huberman to get 20% off any of Inside Tracker's plans. That's insidetracker.com slash Huberman to get 20% off. Today's episode is also brought to us by Blinkist. Blinkist is an app that has thousands of nonfiction books, each condensed down to just 15 minutes of key takeaways for those books. I love reading books from front to back. I like the actual physical book. I'm sort of old fashioned in that way. And I do also listen to audio books. It's very rare that I don't finish a book that I've started. Nonetheless, I like to revisit some of my favorite books. I also like to write down key takeaways from those books, sometimes even before I listen to the full length book. So I don't mind spoiling the, the takeaways because when I read nonfiction, generally I'm trying to extract the most valuable knowledge from them. So I'll often listen to a Blinkist 15 minute version, then the full length book, or sometimes the full length book, and then the Blinkist 15 minute version. Either way, Blinkist is a great way to get through any book and to extract the best from those books. I've used it for, for instance, Matt Walker's Why We Sleep, an excellent book on why we sleep, as well as Tim Ferriss's The 4-Hour Body, uh, Nassim Taleb's The Black Swan, and so on and so on. With Blinkist, you get unlimited access to read or listen to a massive library of nonfiction books. It really is a treasure trove of information. Right now, Blinkist has a special offer just for Huberman Lab podcast listeners. If you go to Blinkist.com slash Huberman, you can get a free seven-day trial and 25% off a Blinkist premium membership. Once again, go to Blinkist.com slash Huberman to get a seven-day free trial and 25% off. And now for my discussion with Dr. Wendy Suzuki. Wendy, great to see you again and to have you here. It's been a little while. It's been a while. So great to be here, Andrew. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, delighted. I'd like to start off by talking about memory generally, and then I'd love to chat about your incredible work discovering how exercise and memory interface and what people can do to improve their memory and brain function generally. Yes. But for those that are not familiar, maybe you could just step us through the basic elements of memory, a few brain structures, perhaps, sure. you know, what happens when I, for instance, this mug of uh, tea, uh, it's pretty unremarkable, mm. but the fact that now I've talked about it, I don't know that I'll ever forget about it. Maybe I will, maybe <laughs> I won't. So what happens when I look at this mug and decide that it's something special for whatever reason? Yeah. Well, I like to see there are four things that make things memorable. Number one is novelty. If it's something new, the very first thing, uh, the very first time we've seen something or experienced something, our brains are drawn to that. Our attentional systems draw us to that. And when you are paying attention to something, that's, that's part of what makes things memorable. Second is repetition. If you see that cup of tea every single day and every single time you do an interview, you talk about your cup of tea, you're going to remember it. That's just uh, uh, how, how our brains work. Repetition works. Third is association. So if you meet somebody new that knows lots of people that you know, so you and I share many, 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 many people that we both know, it's, easy to remember, it's easier to remember you, especially if you were somebody new that I hadn't met before, we have met before. Uh, so association. Um, and then the fourth one is emotional resonance. So we remember the happiest and the saddest moments of our lives. And that also includes you know, funny, surprising things. Uh, that is the interaction between two key brain structures uh, the amygdala, which is important for processing uh, lots of emotional, particularly threatening kinds of situations. But uh, those threatening, surprising kinds of situations, the amygdala takes that information and makes another key structure called the hippocampus, 
work better to put new long-term memories in your brain. So that, in fact, is the key structure for long-term memory, this structure called the hippocampus. Fantastic. So novelty, repetition, association, and emotional resonance. Yes. You can tell us a bit more about the hippocampus. I think, um, at least for my generation, uh, well, I'm a neuroscientist, but for most people in my generation, I think they first heard about the hippocampus from the movie Memento. Oh, yeah. Where the yeah. guy says hippocampus. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and if, if for those of you that haven't seen that movie, it's a bizarrely constructed movie, but an interesting one nonetheless um, about memory. But even as a neuroscientist, sometimes I'm perplexed at how uh, the hippocampus works. Mm. You know, maybe you could, if you wouldn't, if you would, you know, step us through kind of what this structure is, what it yeah. looks like, um, maybe a few of its subregions, because right. um, you know, unlike vision, the topic mm-hmm. that I've worked most of my yeah. career on, where we know, okay, the eye does this part, and the thalamus does this part, and the cortex does that part. I've always been a little perplexed about the hippocampus, mm. frankly. Okay. So, um, and I've read the textbooks and I've heard the lectures, but yeah. I'd love to get the update. You know, what are the general themes of the hippocampus as a structure yeah. and its function? Yeah. Um, what do you think everyone, including neuroscientists, mm-hmm. uh, should know about the hippocampus? Absolutely. So let's start with the basics. The word hippocampus means seahorse. It is shaped, the structure is shaped like a kind of curly Q seahorse. That is accurate. Um, Everybody, including neuroscientists, should know it's a beautiful structure. It is visually, anatomically beautiful with these kind of intertwining, twirly subregions within it. And I think that's one of the reasons why early anatomists, who were the very first neuroscientists, got attracted to it, because it's this interesting kind of twirly structure deep in the heart of the brain. So that's anatomically. Functionally, what does it do? Well, it's easiest to understand what it does when you uh, look at what happens when you don't have a hippocampus anymore. What if you, what if by some, you know, disease or, or you have your hippocampus removed by accident, um, what happens? Well, we know this from the most famous neurological patient of all time. Uh, his uh, initials were HM, so all psychology neuroscientists, neuroscience students know him. Uh, he was operated in 1954, and uh, the paper was published in 1957. Um, they removed both the hippocampi because he had very terrible epilepsy. And um, they knew that the hippocampus was the genesis of, of epilepsy, and this was experimental. His epilepsy was so bad that they decided not just to remove one hippocampus, but both. And what happened was immediate, um, immediate loss of all ability to form new memories for facts and events. Think about that for a second. All facts or events you're not able to remember. I can't remember this interaction between us. I can't remember any of the facts that we were just chatting about in our neuroscience lives. Um, None of that can move into our long-term memory. So this hippocampus does something with all of these perceptions that are coming at us every single day, every minute of the day, and not for all of them, But for some of them that have these features that we just talked about, maybe they're novel, maybe they have associations, maybe they're they're emotionally relevant, maybe uh, uh, maybe they've been repeated. Some of those things uh, in the realm of facts or events get uh, uh, encoded in our long term memory, and um, that's that's the textbook of of why the hippocampus is so important. I like to always add, and I mean this is why I studied it for so many years. The hippocampus and what it does really defines our own personal histories. It means it defines who we are. Because if we can't remember what we've done, the information we've learned, and and the events of our lives, it it changes us. That's what really defines us. That's why I wanted to study the hippocampus. And I think the exciting new new ideas about the hippocampus was, um, is, that it's, it's, you know, hippocampus is important for memory. So if you say that, you'll be impress all your people at your, uh, at your cocktail party. But what people have started to realize that it's not just memory. It's not just putting together associations for what, where, and when of, 
of events that happened in our past, but it's putting together information that is in our long-term memory banks in interesting new ways. I'm talking about imagination. So without the hippocampus, yes, you can't remember things, but actually you're not able to imagine uh, events or situations that you've never experienced before. So what that says is the hippocampus is important for memory is a too simple a way to think about it. What the hippocampus is important for is what we've already talked about, associating things together writ large. Anytime you need to associate something together, either for your past, your present, or your future, you are using your hippocampus. And it takes on this much more important role in our cognitive lives when we think about it like that. That is kind of the new, the new hippocampus that, that neuroscientists are studying these days. Well, that's fantastic. So it sounds like it really sets context, but it can do that with elements from the past, the present, yeah. or the future. Yes. And uh, the uh, well, for neuroscientists, the, the phrase is domain. We say the time domain, yes. uh, meaning as opposed to just evaluating things in space. It sounds like the time domain of hippocampal functioning is incredibly interesting. It is. And, and even the fact that we can have short-term, medium-term, and long-term memories. And we could go down any of these rabbit yeah. holes. <laughs> um, I'll ask you a true or false, mostly because okay. I just really want to know the answer. Okay. A few years ago, the theme in various high-profile reviews seemed to be that the hippocampus was involved in encoding, in creating memories, but not in storing memories, and that the memory storage was in the neocortex or the other overlying areas of the brain. Is that too general a statement? Um, that's, a, that's a tricky statement because I think that ultimately, yes, that long-term memories are stored in the cortex. But those memories are stored in the hippocampus sometimes for a very, very long time. So how long is too long where you say, oh, it's not the hippocampus anymore? If it's four years, is that, <laughs> does that mean that it's, you know, it, it's not stored in the hippocampus? I think that's a, that's a tricky question. And yes, it was coming up a lot because people were debating it. And, and some people did think that you shouldn't think about the hippocampus as a storage area. But I think it's a long, long, long-term kind of intermediate storage area, maybe not the long-term storage area. That's why it's hard to answer that question. Great. As I recall, <laughs> HM could remember facts from before his surgery. Yes. He couldn't form new memories. Correct. And given that he had no hippocampus, it would at least partially support the idea that some of memories are retained outside the hippocampus. However, he did have part of his posterior hippocampus intact. Ah. So that's the tricky thing. I think initially, um, in fact, Scoville, the, the um, neurosurgeon, overestimated the number of millimeters he had want, he intended to remove of the hippocampus. And then when they did this, uh, the, the, the very historic MRI of HM later in his life, they showed that in fact, he did have that posterior hippocampus, part of the posterior hippocampus intact. So now it makes, makes it a little bit more complicated to interpret what's going on. Not that it was never uncomplicated, any interpretation of a lesion in, in a patient, as you know, is complicated. But, um, you know, HM had this mythical role in, in neuroscience and neurology. And now it was, it was, it was complicated because he, he does have more of the hippocampus intact. Got it. I did not know that. Uh, there are some memories that can be formed very quickly, mm. so-called one-trial learning. Yeah. And I'm just looking at this list again, novelty, repetition, association, and emotional resonance. Uh, it seems like some experiences can bypass the need for multiple repetitions. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, uh, and unfortunately, it seems that our nervous system is skewed toward creating one-trial memories yeah. for negative events, right. which has a survival adaptive mechanism. Yeah. What is the neural connection that allows that to happen? Is it the amygdala to hippocampus connection? I mean, as you and I know, the, it seems like every brain area ultimately is connected to everything right, else. It's just right. a question of uh, through how many nodes, just like yeah. every city is connected to another city. It's right. just a question of how many flights and roads yeah. do you have to uh, traverse before yeah. you uh, get there. What is it about one trial learning? I mean, at, at a kind of top contour level, how do we, how can we learn certain things so fast Yeah, and other things are 
are tricky. And now every time I look at this white mug, it's mm-hmm. queuing up something special that uh-huh. simply by virtue of saying it. Yeah. So is that one trial memory? But uh, you know, what is what is it about very emotionally salient events that allow memories to get stamped in? Yeah, I mean, I think you you you've already alluded to it. That is, there is this protective function. Um, of our brains that has evolved over the last 2.5 million years, that you need to pay attention and remember certain things for your survival. So some things that get stamped in, um, you know, they're, they're memories, but they're they're fear memories. You know, if I get mugged on the subway or, you know, there are terrible things that could happen on the subway as we, as we just learned. Um, but if something terrible happens, if something very scary happens, um, you remember that and that that fear and that memory of all those things. I mean, I, I have one uh, when I lived in Washington, D.C., I went to work at NIH on a Sunday afternoon and I came back and when I rounded the corner to my door of my apartment, um, it was crowbar barred in. Somebody had taken a crowbar, opened up my door and stole all of my, all of my, the nicest things in my apartment, which wasn't that nice because I... It wasn't making that much money, but ever since um, ever since then, whenever I rounded that corner, I still had that memory. It was terrible because you know it put me in a terrible state w- when I was just coming home, and that that's a survival mechanism. Do you want to uh, be alert to possible danger? Absolutely, yes. So part of those one trial memories, I think, is often taking advantage of this evolutionarily developed system to tamp in things that could be potentially dangerous to you into your memory. So you forever will remember this particular corner or this this hallway because that is where something really bad happened to you. It seems like a location. We talk about conditioned place aversion, yes. which is yeah. just a geek speak for wanting to avoid the place where something bad happened or conditioned place preference, wanting to go back to a place where something positive happened. We're even looking at a photograph of where yeah. you had a wonderful time with somebody and that can evoke all sorts of um, positive sensations. It seems like at some level, the you know, as complex as the brain is, the basic elements of uh, feeling good or feeling lousy are, are states within the brain and mm-hmm. body. And linking those to places seems like it. it's a pretty straightforward formula. You know, link place to state, uh-huh. link state to place, et cetera, yeah. as your uh, description just provided. When we learn more complex information, mm. you know, uh, uh, a poem, um, mm. a, a concept, or we have to ratchet through a set of ideas, uh, that also involves memory. Yeah, it, I'm sure that we'll talk more about this, but is there any way that uh, you're, you're aware of that state, bodily state, can be leveraged to enhance the speed or the, the quality of, the, of memories? And memory formation, because you know that. So, to be clear about it, it seems there's something very important about this fourth, uh, you know, this emotional resonance mm-hmm. component. Yeah, yeah. right. Um, novelty, the crowbar into the door. Mm-hmm. Is, uh, thank goodness, is a sounds like it was novel. It wasn't yes. a repeated thing. Right, thank right. goodness. So repetition is out, and the association is very, very strong. Mm-hmm. But for people trying to learn information that they're not that excited about, right? Or that um, repetition is hard, mm-hmm. or the the novelty is simply that it's painful. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, I've been there. You know, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, as as have I. Is there something that we can do to le- to leverage knowledge of how the memory system works naturally to to make that a a more straightforward process? So I I immediately turn to. Um, the things that I've studied that you talk about so beautifully on your podcast, which are uh, strategies generally to make your brain work better. I was just reminding myself of your podcast about cold, uh, um, because I use that every oh, morning. Oh, you do cold? I do. I just do. take a, a moment and, and just okay. tell us what is your cold exposure so protocol, then I'll cold, take you back to okay. what you're saying. So my cold exposure protocol is uh, at the end of every morning shower that I, that I take, um, you know, you, the shower is, is warm, but I give myself a big blast of cold at the, at the end of that. And it makes me feel so good. And because I've been doing it for several years, 
it's so much less painful. Okay, I admit it was really painful at the, at, at the beginning, um, but it's much less painful. I could I could handle the cold water, and my pipes are give nice, really cold water, um, and it just I could feel I could feel the the awakeness kind of come come up in me after that and so um, and I miss it if I forget to do it sometimes I run back in and give myself that cold blast because it is it is upping you know I think you talked about this on your podcast what's happening in the brain it, basically the cold stimulus that shock yeah. that you know catching your breath etc is adrenaline from the adrenals but also from what we understand now some new neuroimaging there's epinephrine and norepinephrine re- released from locus ceruleus yeah. which again is a brain structure in the back of the brain kind of sprinklers the the rest of the brain with with a kind of a wake up chemical and there's a long arc on mm. dopamine release this mm. paper back in 2000 showed that it's a steady increase up to about 2.5x of circulating dopamine yeah. so they weren't looking directly in the brain mm-hmm. admittedly but it goes on for four or five hours. Wow. So yeah. the improved mood and the feeling of alertness is a real thing. Yeah, right? yeah. Yeah. So so I use that. I mean, so basically I use my morning routine. What is my morning routine? I get up, I do a 45-minute um, tea meditation. So meditating over the brewing and drinking of tea that I learned from a monk um, who has an institute in Taiwan where he teaches tea meditation Love it. I've learned all about tea, um, different kinds of tea. Uh, and then I do a 30-minute cardio uh, cardio weights workout. Um, then I take my shower with the, with the hot, cold contrast. Um, and, oh, and before that, key thing, if I want to learn something and, and I want to be able to um, get over the, 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 the difficulty of repeating things or just just push myself to do stuff. Sleep, so good, good sleep. I've learned that over the pandemic, um, I did sleep experiments on myself and I learned that I was sleeping an hour less than I really needed. So I really need seven and a half to eight hours of sleep and I was getting six and a half. And so now, you know, I get get that seven and a half to eight hours every single night. And guess what? I come to different difficult tasks and I am more willing to give it a try, to try longer, to try harder. And my brain works better. And so I think probably if you go back to all of your podcasts, you'll learn exactly why each one of those things that I do, which I would bet that you probably do too, is helping my brain. Uh, I... Guarantee they are, and I'm, I'm impressed that you do all these things, although not surprised. And I should say that the extra hour of sleep is really impressive um, and extremely beneficial. I'm curious, do you get that uh, in the early part of the night by going to bed earlier? Yeah. Or you, yeah. Terrific. And and I should just mention, because um, you're too humble to do it, but I'll say it again, that yes, not only are you a full professor running a, a tenured full professor and running a laboratory, you teach undergraduates, you have a an important role in public education, multiple books, and you're now dean of the, the, the College of Arts and Sciences at NYU. So the extra hour of sleep is benefiting you and, in, and as a consequence, uh, benefiting everybody else as yes. well. Thanks for sharing with us your protocol. I took you off the trajectory of what one can do, <laughs> but I, I think that people and, and I uh, appreciate knowing you know, kind of what the practical steps are. Yeah, yeah. Because knowing the science is important. Mechanism, I do believe, is is important for embedding uh, protocols in people's minds and why they might want to do them. But really hearing the, the, the mechanics of it right. is useful. It sounds like everything together takes about an hour. It's not an excessive amount of time, but it probably gives you an outsized positive effect oh, on, yeah. on your day. Absolutely. I definitely notice it um, if I'm not able to do it uh, and and when I don't, so I I do this seven days a week. It's also not just you know five days, seven days a week. And um, when I can't do it, it's usually early morning flights or things like that. And and um, and I get over it. But it's uh, critical Great. critical for the working of my brain. I love it. And I'll just highlight one thing that you said. Uh, before we move on, which is that you said when sometimes if you get out of the shower before the cold, you'll get back in. Yeah. That's to me a, a really beautiful example of condition place preference. You know, there's some, <laughs> exactly. now the cold shower has become something that you sort of look forward to. I should say that nobody is immune from the adrenaline increase of cold. No matter how cold the day, this is what's mm. interesting about cold. Mm. It's one of the reasons why 
it's such an important part of the screening for special operations, you know, mm. so, so our SEAL teams, but other yeah. other uh, branches of military too, which is that there are very, very few stimuli mm -hmm. that you can give anyone uh -huh. and consistently get an adrenaline Oh, interesting. Uh, release from that without harming them. You know, with uh -huh. heat, eventually you yeah. need to use so much heat that you damage yeah. tissue. Yeah. Or with exercise, you have to use so much exercise that you can damage joints. And, yeah. You know, and it's this very kind of um, uh, brilliant, I, I don't know if it was intentional or not. It's sort of unintentional genius that they, that special operations has figured out that by sending people back into the cold over and over, it never uh -huh. really gets easier. Uh -huh. But over time, people actually start to crave it. Yeah. And it provides this reduction in inflammation, et cetera. Yeah. So anyway, beautiful practice. Thank you. I want to learn more about your tea meditation later in the episode. But yeah. um, in any event, returning to ways that, that we can improve memory formation. Yeah. Maybe if you would, tell us your story around this. I know you've told it before, but... Mm -hmm. I think a lot of members of the audience and I would love to hear, you know, how you came to this. Because yeah. growing up in neuroscience, I knew you as one of the, I would say one of the three or four, and they're all alongside one another, not, um, this isn't a hierarchical statement, uh, three or four top memory researchers in the world, right? Textbook material is Suzuki. Uh, in the t My textbooks are filled with the word Suzuki, your last name, <laughs> uh, according to the information on memory and memory formation. So you were doing that mm -hmm. and doing the things that academics do. And yeah. then you're still doing that, but yes. and still at a very high level, but then things took a different direction. And yeah. maybe, maybe we could talk about your story and how um, you came to the place you are at now, yeah. because I think it provides a number of tools that people could um, implement themselves. Yeah, yeah. So this story happened um, as I was working to get tenure at NYU, and, and as you know, it's a, it's a stress-filled process. They give you six years to you know, show your stuff, and you are judged in front of all your colleagues, and either they say, okay, you can join the club, or they say, sorry, you are you know, humiliated in front of everybody. And this was what they, was going through They actually my mind. tell people to leave. Yes. If you don't get tenure, yeah. you're gone. You, you have to leave your right. institution. And so, um, so you, know, you work really, really hard. And so my strategy was, um, I'm just going to not do anything but work. And I'm just going to work and I'm, I'm going to uh, just work as hard as I can for the six years. And um, what happens when you work and you don't have any sort of life outside of work and um, you live in New York where there's all sorts of really good takeout, uh, you gain 25 pounds, which is exactly what I did. And you get really, really stressed. And you start to ask yourself, how come I'm living in New York City and I love Broadway and I've never, I haven't gone to a Broadway show in two years? Um, and so I, I, so I, I, 25 pounds overweight, I, um, I decided to go on vacation and, uh, I went by myself cause I had no friends and I went to, um, I, I did a adventure, um, uh, river rafting trip in Peru. And so I go by myself and, you know, meet other interesting people and, um, I, I was the weakest person on this whole trip. Like I was... I, they were so much in better shape. It was embarrassing. And they won't say this. They won't admit this to me, but it was true. And I kind of came back and I said, okay, I cannot be the weakest person. I'm in my late thirties. I have to do something. So I went to the gym and, um, I said, oh my God, I'm 25 pounds overweight. Let's, let's try at least to, uh, um, lose this weight. And so I go to the gym. Um, I notice how much better I feel when I go to just a single class. I remember the very first class I went to was a hip hop dance class. I'm a terrible hip hop dancer, but I still felt good after, after that class. And then fast forward year and a half, I've lost the 25 pounds. So proud of myself, so much happier. And I'm sitting in my office doing what you and I do a lot, which is writing an NIH grant, which is our lifeblood, right? And um, writing, writing, writing. And this thought goes through my mind that had never gone through my mind before, which what during this six years of, grant, of frantic grant writing when I was trying to get tenure. And that thought was, grant writing went well today. You know, that, that, that felt good. And I was like, I've never had that thought before. What, what's going on here? This is really weird. I don't know that anyone has had that thought before. I, <laughs> yeah. No, I'm sure people have had that thought. But um, I thought maybe I'm just having a good day. Um, but when I thought about it, I thought it's, it's not just today. 
my grant writing seems to have been getting smoother. Like I'm able to focus longer. It the, the sessions feel feel better to me. And you know, at that point, the only thing that I changed in my life it was a huge thing. But I had become a gym rat rather than a workaholic. And that's when my you know spidey sense for neuroscientists popped up. And I said, what do we know about the effects of exercise on your brain? Um, because if I think about it, what was better about my writing is I could focus longer and deeper, very important, and I could remember those little details that you try and pull together for your million dollar NIH grant from you know 30 different articles that you have open on your screen all at the same time. That's the hippocampal memory. I was studying that. I was writing the grants on, on hippocampal memory. And uh, so that's when I got really interested in the effects of exercise on both prefrontal focus and attention function and hippocampal function because of my own observation and this kind of, I still remember where, where I was sitting, which office I was in when I had this revelation. But the thing that really sealed it for me that made me think not just, oh, this is interesting, but I, I want to study this is right around that time, um, I got a phone call from my mom um, who said that my dad wasn't feeling well and that he had um, told her that he got lost driving back from the 7-Eleven, which was literally seven blocks from our house that I grew up in. And um, I knew that was that was hippocampal function. I suspected dementia. I suspected, though didn't want to admit, Alzheimer's dementia, which he, which he had. And um, it was funny because, I mean, it wasn't funny, but um, my mom and dad are two sides of uh, a very different coin. My dad is the, the, uh, the engineer, not so active all his life, but would love to sit, sit and read books all day. My mom was the athlete. She, she played tennis, team tennis, into her 80s. And, uh, and it, it started to show at, at that point. Mm -hmm. And uh, so then I had, then I had even a, a more pressing reason to think about what the effects of exercise were because I noticed that all the things that were improving in my brain suddenly went away in my, my dad's brain. Really, really smart guy, engineer in you know, Silicon Valley, helped, helped that push in Silicon Valley in the 70s happen. He had no more memory. He couldn't focus his attention. His mood was rock bottom. He's a very happy guy. And everything was the opposite in me. And I started thinking, this isn't just something to help you know, somebody who wants to get tenure. Um, this is something that could help millions and millions of people, most importantly, our aging population. What if, you know, what's happening? And so the thing that makes me wake up in the morning is when I realized that every single time you move your body, um, you are um, releasing a whole bunch of neurochemicals. And some of them we've talked about, the, the good mood comes from dopamine and serotonin and noradrenaline. But the thing that gets released also, particularly with aerobic exercise, is a growth factor called um, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, or BDNF. And that is so important because what it does is it goes directly to your hippocampus and it helps brand new brain cells grow in your hippocampus. We all have that. Even if you're a couch potato, you can get new brain cells in your hippocampus to grow. But it's like giving your hippocampus a, um, a boost with this regular BDNF if you are exercising, which means that we all have the capacity to grow a bigger, fatter, fluffier hippocampus. And so what I like to give people is this image of every single time you move your body, it's like giving your brain this wonderful bubble bath of neurochemicals. What's going on? I, I need my bubble bath of noradrenaline and dopamine and serotonin and growth factors. And with regular bubble baths, what am I doing? I'm growing a big, fat, fluffy hippocampus. And I'm not going to cure my father's dementia, Alzheimer's dementia. But you know what? If I go into my 70s with a big, fat, fluffy hippocampus, even if I have that in my genes and it starts to uh, kick in, it's going to take longer for that disease to start to affect my ability to form and retain new long-term memories for facts and events, which is my motivation for getting up and doing my 30 to 45 minutes of, of aerobic exercise every day. Fantastic. Um, 
quick question about your protocol, just yeah. because, uh, and then I'll, we'll discuss a few mechanistic things related to what signals the body might be sending the brain, mm. and a little bit more uh, detail on uh, BDNF and yeah. some circuitry. So, you. 30 to 45 minutes, of, it sounds like cardiovascular exercise might be special. Yes. But as I say that, I and I think about the literature that I'm aware of mm -hmm. in mice and some in monkeys and certainly in humans, looking at the effects of exercise on brain function and typically the outcome is improvement mm -hmm. almost always. I've, yeah. I don't think I've ever seen a paper showing that when animals or humans exercise more that their brain gets worse. No. Um, I just... Can't yeah. think of a single paper. Doesn't mean yeah. it doesn't exist. I'm sure someone will put one in the comment section. <laughs> <laughs> They'll find that one, and th and thank you for if you can find that. But, um, but it seems like it's always cardiovascular exercise, and experimentally in a lab, it's a lot easier to get a mouse to run on a treadmill yeah. than it is to get a mouse to lift weights. Although people have put <laughs> right. little ankle weights on yeah. mice and done, yes. th and the ways of getting mice to do resistance work is actually a little bit barbaric a because stressful. oftentimes they'll. Yeah they'll incapacitate a limb to overload another limb. Yeah. So it's an asymmetric thing. It's mm -hmm. not the same as sending them in to do squats right. Um, right. or deadlifts or something. Yeah. So, um, but cardiovascular exercise might be special. Yeah. And yeah. what are your thoughts on that? And please first though, tell us your routine. Your routine is 30 to 45 minutes of, are you a Peloton cycler? Yeah. You, does it matter? Um, I think that uh, the data suggests that as long as your heart rate is getting up mm -hmm. for these long-term effects on your hippocampus and prefrontal cortex, you, you also uh, um, get better at shifting and focusing your attention. Um, for that, you need cardiovascular. And what I use is a, a video workout that I started even before the pandemic. It's called Daily Burn. And it's just you know thousands of different workouts. But I love, they are... 30 minutes that I sometimes add on a 10 to 15 minute stretch at the beginning or at the end. But um, I love the variety. Sometimes I do it with weights. Sometimes I do it without weights. Uh, uh, I love kickboxing. So they have a lot of kickboxing in there. It just fits my, um, fits my, fits my routine and it's always there. And I don't have to get all dressed up to go to the gym to, uh, <laughs> to, to work out. So that's, that's what I do. And that's a daily thing. Seven yeah. days a week. Yeah. Seven days a week. Fantastic. Um, so in terms of the, the way that some of these changes are, are being conveyed fr from the body to the brain, yeah. th that fascinates me. Yeah. Right? I mean, as you and I know, and I'm, I'm sort of a repeating record on the uh, podcast, always saying, you know, you, it, you got a brain, but you also have a spinal cord mm -hmm. and then your nervous system connects everything. Yeah. Every organ in your body is right. basically signaled to by the nervous system and back to the nervous system, your spleen, everything. But so let's imagine your morning routine, you, you, do your cardiovascular exercise. Okay, so you're pumping more blood. Mm -hmm. That's the definition of a higher heart rate. Stroke volume of the of the of the heart goes up over time. You're getting yeah. fitter. So blood flow to the brain is increasing. Mm. Do we know how that gets translated to a signal to release more BDNF? Mm, yeah, you know. And then it raises this other question, which is: Does it matter where your mind is when you exercise? Mm, yeah. Because ultimately, the brain, of course, you can anchor your attention to the exercise, or you can mm -hmm. be listening to a podcast or right. something else. I've always wondered about this. Yeah, you know, yeah. Can, can we enhance the effects of exercise by combining the enhanced blood flow mm -hmm. with cognitive work during exercise? Yeah, yeah. Or is it simply a matter of just getting more blood flow up to the mm -hmm. hippocampus? Yeah, I wish I had the answer to that question too. My instinct is, yes, it matters, partially because of the work of your colleague, Aliyah Crum, on, on mindset and the power of that to change how physiologically our body is responding. So how could it not work in her experiments and or work in her experiments and not work for my my morning or our morning exercise routine? So but but are there studies point to a study? I don't know of one. So exercise uh, uh, neuroscientists out there, I'd love to see you know that 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 study done. Um, so yes, it works. Um, before I go into the aerobic thing, I always like to start with the least amount of exercise to get something really mm -hmm. useful because I don't want people to say, oh God, I hate, you know, sweating. I don't want to listen anymore. So, so I always like to start with um, studies have shown that just 10 minutes of walking outside can shift your mood. That is part of that neurochemical bubble bath that you're getting dopamine, serotonin, noradrenaline. Um, and 10 minutes, and anybody can walk for 10 minutes. Um, and so that is uh, 
for all of you thinking that out there. What is the minimum that I could get some of these brain effects? 10 minutes of walking, anybody can do it. Uh, is outside important? I'm a big believer in getting photons yeah, into the yeah. eyes. It, you know. um, I think that that study was done indoors on a treadmill, So, and, and the comparison wasn't done. But moving your, which is great. I, you know, some in the middle of the pandemic, I walked around my apartment for 30 minutes sometimes just for some variety. Uh, felt like a rat on a running wheel, but, mm -hmm. but um, uh, yes. So, so that, that minimum amount of movement in your body can get you the, those mood effects. But what about the big, fat, fluffy hippocampus? What about the better performing prefrontal cortex? That's where you start to need the, the cardio, cardio workout. And from my reading of the literature, there haven't been enough studies, you know, um, uh, directly comparing, contrasting kickboxing with running, with um, whatever, whatever other cardio that you need to do. But any cardio workout that is done has these positive effects. So I'm going to say my interpretation of that is that whatever way you get your heart rate up, including a power walk, a power walk can get your heart rate up, that that is beneficial. And what is happening, there are two pathways that have been studied about how you go from moving your body to more BDNF, that, that neurotrophin that's, uh, that's um, increasing the growth of new hippocampal brain cells. The two pathways are the following. One is a myokine, which is a protein released by the muscles. So, and not your heart. These are striated muscles um, in your body. And so by running, this, these were studies done in rats on running wheels. They showed that the running rats had um, more of this myokine release. The myokine passed the blood-brain barrier, so it got into the, the uh, rarefied, very protected bloodstream of inside the brain. And that myokine stimulated the release of BDNF in the brain. That's pathway number one. Pathway number two comes through the liver uh, because exercise is a stress on generally. Uh, how do we know that? Well, cortisol is released whenever we exercise. It, we, we need we need uh, that sugar uh, in our blood, and so so that's how the physiological um, mechanisms work. And so um, there is a uh, ketone, um, uh, beta hydroxybutyrate, that we've known for a very long time that gets released by the liver during exercise. And we also know that that particular ketone passes that blood-brain barrier. And it's another stimulant for BDNF. So kind of the final common pathway seems to be um, BDNF stimulation in the hippocampus. Is it the only one? Probably not, but that's the one that has been studied most most clearly. So it's you know it comes from all of our physiological systems, our muscles working, our liver um, responding to the stress of of exercise. And what is it doing? It is making our uh, you know giving more BDNF precursors to get into our brain to cause the up spike of BDNF, um, which is part of your bubble bath that you're getting every time you move. I love that description of a factor from muscle and a factor from liver because anytime we're thinking about movement of the body and translating that to the brain, uh, as you so clearly pointed out, that needs to be true. It needs to traverse the blood brain barrier. Mm -hmm. Not everything that happens in the body is communicated to the brain. Yeah. Uh, and these seem like really important signals. Um, beta hydroxybutyrate, uh, you mentioned, is a ketone. Uh, I just want to underscore that doesn't mean, folks, that you need to be on a ketogenic diet. I think people hear ketone and they think, mm -hmm. it, you know, I know some people are, most people are not, I imagine. Um, there are ketones that are released in your brain and body that can function even if you're um, ingesting carbohydrates and not <laughs> ketogenic, just for a point of clarification. Um, this issue of new neurons mm. is one that you hear a lot. Mm. You know, neurogenesis, yeah. you're going to grow new neurons, new neurons. And, and my understanding is that the rodent literature is very clear mm -hmm. that animals that run on wheels more often, um, it turns out rodents love to run on wheels. Yes, Do you know yes. these studies by Hoppy Hofstra, which are pretty funny? Um, they're very cool, by uh -huh. the way, Hoppy, uh, how Hughes <laughs> investigator. I'm not, I'm not making light of them. Yeah. If they put running wheels in a field uh -huh. and ro wild <laughs> rodents will really? run to the running wheel and run on that running wheel. Oh, that's so there's great. some, they really enjoy it. Yeah, yeah. Which I find amusing yeah. for reasons that probably only a neuroscientist would right. find amusing. <laughs> um, in any case, in rodents, it seems that uh, running more on a wheel 
can trigger neurogenesis. That yes. Literally the, the, the birth of new neurons and the addition of new neurons to the hippocampus. In monkeys, this has been controversial. It seems it does happen in the hippocampus and mm -hmm. in the olfactory bulb, yeah. probably not in the neocortex. Right. Thinking back to the decades or more old yeah. controversy between Liz Gould and Pashko Rakish, I hope they settled their, their differences there. Uh, neuroscientists love to argue. Um, <laughs> it's kind of what we do. Um, and in humans, I think it's been a bit controversial. Like some people say absolutely yes. Other people say absolutely no. There are new neurons added to the adult brain. I haven't followed that literature down mm. to the detail, yeah. um, but I do remember one study that I don't think is contested, which is the work of Rusty Gage at the Salk Institute, mm -hmm. where they actually injected a, a sort of dye type marker into the brains of terminally ill humans yeah. who very graciously offered to have their brains removed and dissected mm -hmm. after death. Yeah. And in these very in some cases, very old, mm -hmm. terminally ill humans, they did see evidence for new neurons yes. being born in the hippocampus. Right. Can I trust that idea still? Is that uh, uh, generally accepted? Well, so after that study, which was quite a while ago, uh, there are more recent studies, still controversial, but um, showing and demonstrating using even new and better techniques than were used in that, that original Rusty Gage study, which was groundbreaking at the time, that... Um, that suggest and I think show that there are new neurons born in uh, ad adult human brains into the ninth decade of life. Wow. So they not only did this, I think those, those patients were in their 60s, then they, they died of cancer, um, but, but these new studies uh, looking across the timeline, can we see? Because the other thing was, yeah, maybe you have some when you're 20, but by the time you're older and you might need these new neurons, you have no new neuron growth. And so these studies seem to uh, suggest that yes, yes, you did. Y yes, you do. And we all do, even into old age. Great. So, yeah. Great. And um, I'll just take a moment to say that I am personally not aware of any studies looking at other forms of exercise besides cardiovascular exercise for sake of brain health. And this, I think, is an important um, gap in the literature that mm -hmm. ought to be filled, whether or not, for instance, high-intensity interval training or whether or not weight training, um, which has other effects on the musculature. So you can imagine perhaps the myokine to right. BDNF pathway, the pathway one that you mentioned might be signaled, but maybe not the liver pathway. Maybe, yes, I'm speculating here. Those studies need to be done. Yeah. To my knowledge, they just haven't been done yeah. yet, yeah. Um, and but they should be done. If you would, could you tell us about some of the more specific effects of exercise on memory? You know, when yeah. memory is a broad category right. of, of, of effects yeah. and phenomena. So things like uh, what comes to mind is short-term, medium, and long-term memory, reaction time. Mm -hmm. um, learning math, at least for me, is quite a bit different than uh, learning history, mm -hmm. um, although there's certainly overlap in the neural, neural underpinnings. But what has been demonstrated in the laboratory yeah. in animal models, but but especially in humans? Yeah, sure. And and if you want to share with us any results from your mm -hmm. your lab, uh, published or unpublished, yeah. I'm sure that the audience would be delighted to learn about them. Absolutely. Let me start with um, kind of the immediate effects, acute effects, as they're called, of exercise on the brain. So this is asking, what does a one-off exercise session do for your brain? And there. Um, uh, there are three major effects that have been reproduced. I've seen it in my lab. Many labs have reproduced this. So what do you get with a one-off? This is usually an aerobic type type exercise session, 30, 30 to 45 minutes. What you get is that mood boost, very, very consistent. You get, um, uh, you get uh, improved prefrontal function, typically uh, tested with a Stroop uh, test, which is a test that uh, asks you to shift and focus your attention in specific ways. Um, it's a challenging task and clearly dependent on the prefrontal cortex, largely. And um, significant improvements in reaction time. So your, your speed at responding, often a motor kind of, uh, but cognitive motor response is, is improved. Um, over the pandemic, one of the unpublished studies that I did, looking at the effects of 30 minutes of age-appropriate workout, um, in subjects ranging in age from their 20s all the way up to their 90s. So what are the um, 
the things that I saw most consistently, irrespective of your age, everybody got a decreased anxiety and depression and a hostility score, which is very important. You know, so it's it's not just decreasing your anxiety and depression, but decreasing your hostility levels. Making we the world a better place. Making the world a better better place. Energy, the feeling of energy went up. And um, what we found is in the older population, even more than in the younger population, we saw improved performance on both Stroop and um, Erickson Flanker task, which are which is another task dependent on um, really focusing in on different letters and paying attention to what letter is being shown. Um, so, so these are consistent effects. How long do they last? One of the studies that I did publish in my lab showed that the immediate effects of exercise lasted up to two hours. Unfortunately, that was the longest that we lasted. We're still there at two hours. Um, so that's, you know, that's, that's a pretty big bang for your buck. That is. One 30 minute. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, I yeah. just want to make sure I understand. So if, if when you say the effects lasted up to two hours, does that mean up to two hours after you finished exercise yes. or up to two hours of memory challenging um, uh, work. Ah. But, yeah, just to, just to be clear. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, my study looked at uh, uh, two hours after you finish your workout, we gave you these cognitive tests. During that two hour period, um, you were free to do anything except exercise or eat. And so th there was no, no uh, extra load on people. But two hours later, you did do significantly better on these uh, focused attention tasks um, compared to a, a group that uh, watched videos for, for the exercise period. This was an hour of um, cycling that they did. These were young, young subjects in their 20s. Okay, so um, if I finish my exercise at 9 a.m., mm -hmm. even if I start this cognitive work, this mental work at 11, I'll still see benefits. Yes, okay, at so, least by 11, because I didn't go farther than two hours. So it could last even longer than that, but but I have evidence that it lasts for two hours. And and perhaps if I had started the cognitive work and 45 minutes after my exercise ended, mm -hmm. it would also be helpful? Yes. So there's I'm no reason sure, to yeah. think that there's a that you have to wait before starting cognitive yeah, work. no reason at all. I'm asking questions of the sort that I get in the okay, comments, great. that we are going to get in the comments okay, section. Great. We always strive for <laughs> clarity here. So what this tells me is that um, exercising early in the day mm -hmm may have a special effect. Right. Uh, I realize that some people cannot exercise until later in the evening, mm -hmm. but you mentioned something earlier that I want to cue people to. It's very, very important. I don't think I've ever mentioned this on the podcast, which is any kind of physical activity will increase cortisol mm -hmm. to varying degrees. Yes. And so sometimes it's a healthy increase. Sometimes it's an unhealthy increase. If you do two hours of really intense exercise mm -hmm. and you're not prepared for it, yeah. that's a big spike in cortisol. Probably not a good thing yeah. for most people. But if you are going to do your cardiovascular or weight training later in the day, mm -hmm. that increase in cortisol can promote too much wakefulness for sleep, et yeah. cetera. Shifting that cortisol spike early in the day is associated with a number of important things related to mood, um, et cetera. But more and more what I'm thinking and hearing is that exercise early in the day is key. Our former dean of the medical school, Phil Pizzo, uh -huh. was and is kind of famous still for uh jogging between the hours of like four and 5 a.m. Uh -huh. or five and six, and then running the medical school. Uh -huh. So, um, <laughs> and you're up early doing your exercise and cold yeah. shower and meditation. Yes. We'll talk about meditation, but yeah. this is more and more of a push, I, I feel like, or, or a, um, a stimulus for us to think about moving our exercise earlier in the day. Yeah, I mean, I like to say that, you know, I, I know there there are moms and dads out there and they just say, look, I have a kid that the kid's more important than my doing my exercise. So you will get benefits if you, if you do it whenever, whenever you can. So that's great. More power to you. But what all the neuroscience data suggests is the best time to do your exercise is right before you need to use your brain in the most important way that you need to use it every day. And so that is why the morning for most of us is beneficial. That's why I do it in the morning. I'm lucky enough to be able to do that. Uh, um, but yeah, it, it it makes sense with all everything we know about how how this works and how it benefits our brain. I think about our colleague um, Eric Kendell, mm. 
who not incidentally has a Nobel Prize and yep. studies memory. And, yep. and um, rumor has it that he's been a, a, a swimmer for a lot of years. Yeah. That he'll put in, I think nowadays he's in his 90s. Now um, he'll put in half a mile, but he used to do, swim a mile a day or something of that wow. sort. I, I heard yeah. that too, that he was a swimmer and he does it very, very religiously. Okay, so there, there are a few other neuroscientists that do that. I can think of a lot of neuroscientists that probably should exercise more. And I don't say that to poke at them. I just would love to see them doing their incredible work for many more decades. Yes. And everything that we're talking about today indicates that if one doesn't, yeah. unless you have incredible genetics, yeah. We all experience age-related dementia, mm -hmm. right? I mean, the story yeah. of your father is a, is a, a salient one, um, and we should remember that as we go forward. But I also want to emphasize, and I'd love to get your thoughts on just memory and memory loss in general. Yeah, It seems we all get worse at right. remembering and learning things, mm -hmm. even if we don't get Alzheimer's. Yeah, When does that typically start for, for humans? You know, I think there's so much variability um, not only because we are individuals, but because our stress levels are different, and um, well, everybody's anxiety level has gone up uh, in the last in the last couple of years. But that also has an effect. We we don't remember as much in highly stressful, highly anxious situations. So. So, you know, as you know, it's hard to answer that question. People say, okay, just tell me how much exercise I have to do. Okay, just 30 to 40 minutes yeah. <laughs> a day. But, but I love the per day. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been doing this whole thing of telling people, oh, the data say 150 to 200 minutes or of zone two cardio, mm -hmm. which is kind of, you yeah. know, moderately hard, but not yeah. excessively hard. Um, but I love this every day. Theme. Yeah. Because what, whenever I do that, the questions that come back are, well, what if I take a long hike on the weekends? Mm -hmm. And so people start negotiating. There's something <laughs> right. that's very powerful about non-negotiable every day. Yes. Sun in your eyes every day, even through cloud cover. Right. Exercise for 30, for, yeah. 45 minutes. Cold yeah. shower every day. Every day, you yeah. Know, um, I, you know, my understanding of the literature is that somewhere in our 50s or 60s, we start noticing little hiccups in memory. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, um, for some people younger, for some people later. Yeah. But I have to imagine that doing the exercise throughout one's entire life is going to help offset some of this simply because you're of the BDNF yeah. and other, other downstream effects. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's, that's what it suggests. One of my favorite studies, and then I want to get back to, um, you wanted, you invited mm -hmm. me to share some of my unpublished data yes, on the effects absolutely. of long-term exercise. But first I want to share uh, one of my favorite studies, which is a longitudinal study um, done in Swedish women, and this was published in 2018. And uh, what they did was, back in the 1960s, they found um, Swedish women, 300 Sw Swedish women in their 40s, and they characterized them as low fit, mid fit, high fit, okay? And then 40 years later, they came back and found these women. They let them do live their lives. And they asked what happened to these women as a function of whether they were low fit, mid fit, high fit in their 40s. They're now in their 80s. Um, and what they found was that um, relative to the low fit or mid fit women, the women that were high fit gained nine more years of good cognition later in life. Now, this is not a randomized controlled study. Um, this is a correlational study. But does it agree with everything that we've been talking about today Yes. Does it agree with this idea that, you know, the women that were high fit were giving their brains this, this bubble bath, you know, maybe not every day, but very, very regularly for that entire 40 years. And that built up their big, fat, beautiful hippocampi. Mm -hmm. Yes, it does. So um, that's one of my favorite studies. Yeah. Another um, cause for getting the exercise in consistently. Yes. Yeah. And there's no, I, I am impressed by this 10 minute walk and the improvements in mood yes. from just a 10 minute walk. Yeah. But again, I, I think that daily repetition also, I have to imagine has effects on the very pathways that allow plasticity. This mm -hmm. is something we, in the realm of neuroplasticity, we don't often hear about or think about even as neuroscientists, which is that the pathways for engaging plasticity probably can be probably mm -hmm. I'm speculating here mm -hmm. can be made better by engaging in the sorts of behavior that stimulate plasticity. In other yeah, words, if one yeah. gets better at calming themselves down mm -hmm. under stress, those right. circuits get better at yes. doing that. Right? Absolutely. There's a, neural circuits gain proficiency. Yeah. And so 
because blood vessels can grow, capillaries can mm -hmm. grow in the brain, you can imagine that more pumping of blood to the brain, delivery of these uh, various muscle and liver factors would also establish larger or more efficient portals to yeah. getting that stuff there. Yeah. So yeah. you could imagine a, a kind of an amplifying effect of, mm -hmm. of exercise. And again, Absolutely. I'm speculating here, but I, I've seen this over and over again in colleagues. The mm -hmm. ones who exercise consistently yeah. seem to be really, really smart and doing amazing work well into their 80s and 90s. Uh -huh. And the ones who aren't, some of whom actually pride themselves on how little they exercise, yeah. um, they get worse over time. Mm -hmm. You see them each meeting each decade, and I'm not poking fun at them at all. Yeah, it's actually yeah. quite quite hard to see. Yeah. And they're kind of a fading light. They're mm -hmm. starting to flicker. Yeah. Um, so there is this incredible relationship between body vitality and brain vitality. Yeah. Um, that is, of course, is not an excuse for spending all day in the gym. Right. Right. The right. gym rats, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I enjoy working out, so I could imagine doing that. But... Um, but that doesn't make us smarter, unfortunately. You actually have to do the cognitive work also, yes, yes, right? It's not right. just exercise. Right, right. So I'd love to hear about some of these new unpublished data. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so when I jumped into the exercise work, um, everybody was studying people 65 or older because that's when cognitive decline begins. And if the idea is exercise can help you with your cognition, then it makes sense. However, I thought, well, you know, that it's great. There's lots of work there. I wanted to know what happens in people in their 40s and the 50s, maybe even their, their 30s and their 20s. Why? Because that's when we as humans are able, ready, will, willing, and able to increase our exercise and um, gets us set, set up to, you know, build our brains as we go into our 60s. And so um, the first study that I did looked at low fit participants from their 30s to mid 50s. And we wanted to ask this question, you know, how much exercise do you really need to start seeing benefits? Do you see benefits? Or maybe you have to wait until you start seeing cognitive decline to get benefits. That was one of the, the theories out there. And so that's what I wanted to do. And so what we did was three months of two to three times a week, Cardio. It was a spin spin class. So you know, spin classes are great for cardio. And the the comparison group was two to three times a week of competitive video scrabble. So no heart rate uh, change, but but they had to come into my lab and and be in a group just like they were in a group for the uh, for the um, um, spin class. Uh, we tested them cognitively cognitively at the beginning of the end of the session. What we found was two to three times a week of cardio. In these people, they were low fit, which means specifically that they were exercising less than 30 minutes a week for the three months previous to the experiment. So they went from that to two to three times a week of spin class. And what we found was um, changes in baseline rates of their positive mood states went up relative to the video scrabble group. Um, their uh, body image, got more positive because they were exercising, which is great. And really important, their motivation to exercise went up significantly compared to the video scrabble group, which is, which is great. So the more you exercise, the more motivated you are to exercise. What about cognition? What changed in the cognitive circuits of their brain? Number one, we got improved performance on the Stroop task, but uh, we're headed towards my favorite structure, which is the hippocampus. What we found was improved performance on both a recognition memory task, which was a um, memory encoding task, um, and uh, that is, can you can you differentiate uh, similar items that we're asking you to remember, and an spatial episodic memory task where we had them play one of those Doom-like games when they went into this spatial maze and they had to do things in a virtual city. Their performance there got better, which is very, very classically dependent on the hippocampus. So, so this, I, it was so satisfying to, to do this study because um, uh, I've been wanting to answer this question. What is a minimum amount or doable amount of exercise that will get you these cognitive benefits? And now I can say in 30 to 50 year olds that are low fit, two to three times a week. Is that doable? Absolutely. 
Will it be hard if you're low fit? Yeah, it's it's going to be challenging, but absolutely doable. And so, you know, that that is uh, it makes sense with all of the all of the um, mechanisms that we are. I didn't study the mechanisms, just to be clear, but with all the mechanisms we are imagining are playing a role here. That absolutely makes sense, and and it is doable. This is not like you have to become marathon runner to get any of these benefits. This is, you have to start moving your body on a regular basis, two to three times a week. And I, so I, I love that for its realness. Mm -hmm. How long are those sessions again? 45 minutes. 45 minutes. Yeah, 45 minutes. Uh, it's a typical spin, uh, spin kind of class. There's a warm up for five minutes and a cool down for five minutes. So it's really, uh, 30, 35 minutes, 35 minutes of, you know, they're, they're really pushing you. Yeah. So, and so they're breathing reasonably hard. Heart yeah. rate, heart rate is up. Heart rate heart is rate definitely is up. up. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. I find that the, uh, all of those results are really interesting. The, the result showing improvement in motivation to exercise yeah. is interesting because it gets back to this issue of kind of a self-amplifying effect. Yeah. Right. And um, the neuroscientist in me wants to, uh, think about kind of pre-motor circuits and the fact that, mm. you know, we have a motor system that can obviously do things like lift cups and walk and run if mm -hmm. we want to or need to, but that um, it's possible to create a kind of anticipatory activity yeah. in our nervous system where right. our body kind of craves a certain stimulus. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the cold and how you yes. crave the cold. Yeah. Now, whether or not that's the adrenaline and the dopamine, mm -hmm. et cetera, or whether or not um, somebody who exercises started going from zero, less than 30 minutes per week to two to three times a week, 45 minutes as you you described for this study. Mm -hmm. it, I've had that experience before of if I'm, the, the cardio that's I tend to battle the most and I I, I love lifting heavy objects, uh -huh. um, <laughs> at least heavy for me. I, I'm happy to go to the gym every other day mm -hmm. and just lift heavy objects for an hour. It mm -hmm. just makes me happy. I like the way it feels. Yeah. And um, I've been doing it since I was in my teens, so 30 years. Cardio is a little bit trickier. I like to run, mm -hmm. but if I stop running for a little while, mm. I find it very hard to get back into. Yeah, yeah. But if I start running three times a week for uh -huh. 30 to 45 minutes, and yeah. I do this pretty consistently on the days I don't weight train, I find that I start to crave it. It's almost as if my body needs that in order to, I always say clear out the cobwebs, but mm. it's like my mind doesn't function as well clearly. Now I yeah. understand why um, and why exercise helps, but also my Physically, I almost feel like my body needs to engage in that movement. Like mm. the premotor circuits mm -hmm. are are kind of revving, kind yeah. of like revving the engine in a car while it's yeah. in park. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the motivation to exercise obviously could be multifaceted. It could right. be purely psychological. But do you think there's any reason to speculate at least or believe that we can build an anticipatory res reverberatory activity mm. into our nervous system? Yeah, yeah. You know, I... I agree with that because I also have those same kinds of thoughts and, and I do have anticipatory exercise when I, I can't do it. So I just got back from a week and week and a half in Paris where I got to do a book launch of, of my last book, Good Anxiety. And um, I, I, I really, I walked around a lot, but I did not do my exercise for that whole week and a half. And, um, but there was a lot of stress because I had to do all these interviews in French. So I gave myself a break. You but speak French? I speak French, I was yes. going to say, otherwise it would be really yeah, that, stressful. Yeah, that would be really um, stressful. Now, <laughs> then I'd be really impressed. Now, then I would definitely start exercising. I would Actually, I would follow your morning routine to a T. But okay, very impressive nonetheless. So, yeah. but I got back and, and you know, coming back this direction from, from Paris, I, I live in New York, is, um, is much easier. And so I was able to get, get up at a normal time the next day. And that exercise session that first day, it's like, okay, I'm back in my home. I'm back in my environment. And it felt so good. It's like, I wanted to come back. And, um, and I know it's because I, I worked up over years. Now I could truthfully say seven days a week, but it was, you know, first it was four to five, then it was five to six. And um, yeah, seven it, but that includes a yoga day or sometimes I have to do it for 10 minutes instead of 30 because I have to leave. But but that habit of you do that, even for five minutes, you do either the the, the wait 10 minute thing or a five minute thing or, or a stretch. Um, that is a, a tiny habit 
Who, is that somebody at Stanford that invented this idea of tiny habits? I there thought couple, it was. There, well, we've got a number of people there. There's, um, and I'm, I apologize in advance to all the people I neglect in this statement, um, but I'm happy to put in the comments, folks. Um, <laughs> BJ Fogg is there, has done. Yes, and that's who I. Yeah, yeah I, BJ's done really yeah. uh, great work. And then um, James Clear wrote a book mm. about habits and uh, has, has a very popular newsletter about habits. Yeah. We've done an episode about habits that covers some of their uh, work and, and some of the, the more laboratory-ish, yeah. uh, not ish, laboratory science peer-reviewed work on yes. it. Yes. Daily behaviors, also daily behaviors performed at roughly the same time yes. of day. Yeah, I mean, one thing powerful. we know for sure is that the circadian system is part of our nervous system's way of anticipating when things will happen, yeah. not just what will happen. I'm telling you things you obviously yeah. know already, but for the audience, performing yeah. your exercise at roughly the same time each day mm -hmm. will make it easier. Yes, As opposed absolutely. to just saying, I'm going to do it seven days a week sometime today. Right. But of course, that getting it done hard. sometime is better than not getting it done. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, the, those are impressive effects. And I love that you're starting to look in populations that are a bit younger, not because yeah. some of these... Um, Older populations aren't important, but I think that building good habits in across one's entire life right. is really what it's about. Right. You, as I always say, with anything related to longevity or offsetting an age-related decline, mm -hmm. we don't know. It's hard to know if things work because right. there's no within subject control. Mm -hmm. But what we also know for sure is that you don't want to be the control experiment. Right. Right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you absolutely don't want to be the control experiment, especially for something that's purely behavioral. I mean, you're not talking about ingesting a particular supplement. You're not mm -hmm. talking about changing your diet in any way. But I am curious, mm -hmm. um, do, you know, diet is a very barbed wire topic on, yeah. the, on the internet, um, which diets, whether or not they work, et cetera. But in general, did you, in the, any of these studies, do they evaluate whether or not people change their eating habits when they start to exercise more? Yeah, um, I think I've seen one study that, that controlled for that. But <laughs> I feel for them because it's hard enough to get people to exercise at the level and at the time and you know that you you need for your study. If you also ask them, okay, fill out this survey to tell us exactly what you ate all day, they're gonna say, forget, <laughs> forget you. I'm not, <laughs> not joining your study. So um, it's a critical question. And um, um, again, there's only been one that I've seen, and and the evidence was that that diets got better. When they, you know, less processed foods when when they did adhere to this exercise, but a lot more information needs to be gathered in that in that realm. The second study that I wanted to share, unpublished, we're we're writing it up right now, is um, part two of that study that I just described, which was the low fit people. Next, we move to mid fit people. It's like, what about us? You know, we're already exercising. How how am I going to benefit from increasing my exercise? So here again, we collaborated with a great um, spin studio that had a whole bunch of mid-fit people that, that by our definition, were exercising um, two to three times a week on a regular basis. That's great. All you people out there that are doing that, you should know you're already benefiting your brain. But our question was, what if we invited them to exercise as much as they wanted at the spin studio for three months from you know, two to three times all the way up to seven times a week? And let's just see what happened. And the control group, um, we asked them not to change their exercise. Um, and so what we ended up with was a nice big array of starting with mid-fit people that exercise between staying at two to three times a week all the way up to seven times a week. And the bottom line from that study is every drop of sweat counted. That is, the more you change and you increase your workout up to seven times a week, the better your mood was. You had lower, um, uh, lower amounts of depression and anxiety, higher amounts of good, um, uh, good affect, and the better your hippocampal memory was with the more you worked out. Again, this was for three months. So I love that too, because it gives power to, to those of us that are you know, regularly exercising and wondering, do I really need to? I mean, is it really gonna help me? And the answer is yes. I mean, not all of us can exercise, go, go to a spin class seven times a week. But um, I love the message that 
our body is responsive to that. And, and you can get better hippocampal function, better overall baseline mood affect with, with a higher level. So it works for uh, the mid-fit uh, people as well. Fantastic. The, the more I, I learn from you, the more I'm starting to conceptualize the brain as an organ that is privileged in so many ways. You know, it has this unique blood-brain barrier, yeah. um, has this incredible quality of being able to predict things, and its job mainly is, of course, to predict things among, among other functions, of course. But that our brain isn't necessarily going to stay stable or get better over time, that it needs a signal. Yeah. It, that it isn't sufficient to just say that we can't take it for granted, that, that our brain is actually an organ that n requires a signal mm -hmm. in order to maintain its own function. Yeah. And it sounds like enhanced blood flow and these pathways that you described earlier, these two pathways, um, are at least uh, among the more critical signals. Um, I'm tempted now to move my frequency of cardiovascular exercise from, I confess it's about three days, 35 minutes lately, and it should be more, uh, to daily. There's something really, again, really special about daily because yeah. it's non-negotiable. Right. You just do it. Right. Um, and it sounds like if one were to do higher intensity exercise, mm -hmm. you know, in a spin class, I've never taken a spin class, but I've seen there are times when they're standing up on yeah. the bike and pedaling very hard. Yeah. So th that is included in these kinds of workouts, Absolutely, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that's what the instructor is doing. I cannot control. <laughs> right. uh, we did monitor heart rate uh, you know, of all the subjects, and it was clearly, you know, <laughs> compared to the video Scrabble, it was highly right. significant. I would hope different. so. Yes. I guess it depends on how intense that game of Scrabble is. But, <laughs> um, could we just briefly talk about uh, mindset and affirmations? Yeah. Uh, sure. You've talked a bit um, before about uh, affirmations and. As you mentioned, the the beautiful work of my colleague at Stanford, Aaliyah Crum, mm -hmm. um, and who uh, we can summarize her work pretty simply, although we won't do it complete justice by it. She's already been on the podcast. That yeah. just to say that one's beliefs about a behavior also impact the outcomes of that behavior. Yeah. If you learn a lot of true facts <laughs> about stress being good for you, then you will experience stress as better for you than mm -hmm. if you only focus on or learn about the negative effects of stress. If you learn about the positive effects of exercise, you actually mm -hmm. derive greater benefit from exercise, yeah. believe it or not. Mm -hmm. uh, it's incredible, <laughs> incredible effects, but they make sense when you yeah. understand what the brain is doing, which right. is a lot of this predictive coding and mindsets don't seem as mysterious and woo mm -hmm. anymore once yeah. you understand what the brain is really doing. But what is, if any, the value of affirmation, of telling yourself something positive about yourself yeah. or of exercise on not the exercise itself, mm -hmm. but on mood, self-image, yeah. memory, and brain function. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, I, um, I, I looked into this because I am also a certified exercise instructor and the form of exercise that I teach is called Intensati. That it's a form of exercise that was developed by this amazing um, fitness instructor, Patricia Moreno. Um, and she combined physical movements from kickbox and dance and yoga and martial arts with positive spoken affirmations. So each move, if you're punching back and forth as you would do in a kickbox class, you don't just punch, you say something like, I am strong now, which every punch is associated with a word. And you know, you, you can um, create your own series of affirmations with the moves that you put together. And um, the first time I did it, I just wandered into her class. I didn't know what it was. And it, I felt idiotic. It's like, what? Are the, I came into the wrong class. I clearly, I don't want to come into this class. But then um, I saw they didn't care whether I thought they were, they looked silly saying these, affirm not saying, yelling these affirmations out loud while doing the choreography at the same time. And then I tried it, you know, okay, I didn't yell out. I kind of whispered it at first. Uh, and then, but by the end, I was really yelling it out. There's something about the declaration using your own voice of saying things that you, you know, don't often say to yourself, like, I'm strong, I'm inspired, I believe I will succeed, are all the kinds of affirmations you say. And you walk out of that class, or I walked out of that class thinking, oh, I feel really good now. Man, I, I can't wait to come back to this class, which is why ultimately, you know, took teacher training to, to be able to teach that class. And so um, I uh, 
I started to look into what was known about affirmations and they were never combined with, with physical activity, but it was clear that there was a, a literature showing that, that uh, positive affirmations, saying them or reading them um, could change mood in the same way as we're talking about, you know, Aaliyah Crumb's work. If you, if you have this, this, it's a belief. You, once you start saying these things, these are not, you know, p- th- th- difficult things to believe, but it's amazing how much you, you don't say these kinds of things to yourself or with your own voice. You might say them about somebody else. Oh, you're, you're strong. You're, you're so smart. Do you say that about yourself? And that's the thing about the, the self-affirmations. It really gets you into a habit of, of saying good things about yourself. And then you start to, remember, uh, start to realize, oh my God, I'm so mean to myself. <laughs> I, I have lots of negative thoughts going on about about myself in my head, and which was part of the other reason why I loved this this particular form of exercise. So what you get in intensati is the mood boost from the positive spoken affirmations, together with all the other brain and um, affect boosts that we've been talking about for this whole. Uh, podcast from the exercise because it's a sweaty workout as well. So interesting. Uh, there's a book. I confess I haven't read it, but I have had the uh, pleasure of having a discussion with a psychologist from I believe is at University of uh, Michigan mm. in Ann Arbor. Ethan Cross wrote a book called Chatter, mm. which focuses on um, the fact that so much of our inner dialogue it is indeed negative. Mm. He certainly wasn't the first to to um, point that out, but that explicit statements to counter that negative chatter, I believe, is one of the hallmarks of of readjusting one's own, not just internal reference frame, but actually self-image generally. Yeah, yeah. And it's a fascinating and, and I think a very uh, important area of psychology and neuroscience because mm-hmm. Uh, and I and I acknowledge this. We're talking about this two laboratory neuroscientists who record from neurons and label neurons and look at stuff down the microscope. We are now deep in the territory, in the <laughs> deep water of what some of our colleagues and and um, people who think about neuroscience would consider like really out there on the kind of subjective edges. Yeah. And yet, I think it's worth pointing out that. You know, the brain does all these things. It's responsible for simple reflexes and motor behaviors, but also Mm -hmm. high-level conceptual um, ideas about the universe and what it might look like in 10 years or 100 years or 1,000 years, but also high-level conceptual understanding of what who we are and what we are about. And so even though it might seem a little bit out on the the fringes, uh, dare I say, I think that these are some of the more important untread landscapes of neuroscience. And I, I just want to acknowledge my appreciation for the fact that uh, I'm going to connect the dots here and say, you went from somebody who didn't exercise, who went on this rafting trip yeah. that discovered exercise and its benefits for your grant writing and then yeah. and then on and on and on, and then became a certified yeah. uh, exercise uh, instructor. instructor. So, yeah. so uh, you don't do anything halfway either, <laughs> no. as it's clear. Um, I'd like to touch on um, something you mentioned earlier, but we haven't... Um, dove into it all in any depth, which is meditation. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned this tea meditation. You had yeah. a, a, a publication recently on a 10-minute med- meditation, Yes. right? Could, yeah. Maybe you could tell us about this 10-minute meditation yeah. because it seems yeah. like such a tractable uh, amount of time. Right. Um, and then if you would maybe tell us a little bit about the tea meditation, yeah. but it sounds like you've discovered a minimum a close to minimum threshold yeah. of meditation that can really benefit us. So, yeah, yeah. Um, so maybe you tell us about that that yeah. study. So the study was, uh, as you as you um, very astutely pointed out, very practical study. Um, just ten minutes, not thirty minutes, not an hour meditation. That's too hard. Ten minutes guided meditation. They logged into a site, so we can tell that they logged in, and they listened to a. Um, it's a body scan, very basic but easy to follow kind of meditation. And we asked them to do it. How often? Daily, seven days a week. You know, just ten minutes a day. And the shock, the most shocking thing about this study is that we got more adhesion adherence to the 10 minute daily meditation than the 10 minute daily podcast listening, which was our control. So the highest retention rate I've ever gotten in any, this kind of study that I've done exercise or meditation, they wanted to do it 
10 minutes a day. It was, it was great. I'm going to just start leading meditations yeah. for three hours as opposed to doing three hour podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so uh, we looked at cognitive effects um, before and after this. It was eight weeks of daily, it was actually 12 minute meditation, um, 12 minutes of body scan meditation. And um, what we found was significant decreases in stress response. So we did the Stryer tr stress test to see how, how you responded to an unexpected stressful situation. The meditators did much better. Their mood was better and their, um, their cognitive performance was also better. And this was my first little foray into meditation after I had started my, my personal tea meditation um, um, that, that really shifted my relationship with, with meditation. And, uh, um, but, but it is consistent with many other studies showing the beneficial effects of um, meditation. And, but the unique thing was we tried to make it doable that many, many people out there could actually follow this, this typical re regimen. And, um, uh, and so we're, we're continuing that. In fact, my, my research in my lab right now is all about those doable, short things that NYU college students will do, not just at the beginning of the semester, but at the end of the semester, when the stress and anxiety levels are now at record-breaking high levels, and they need something to bring that level down so that they could show their professors what their brains can actually do. And so it includes very short meditations, sound, sound meditations, visual meditations, walking, things that any college student, but we're obviously focused on NYU students, um, will do to, um, and you know, I, I wanna get at graduation rates. I wanna get at uh, class performance with these kinds of uh, interventions. Uh, but it started with that study that I just described, That's meditation. Great. Um, if you would, um, and here's where we can highlight this again as some, um, educated spec, highly educated speculation yeah. It's coming from you. Um, <laughs> what do you think is going on during meditation? Yeah. Um, I mean, so a body scan involves a kind of a interoceptive awareness, like, mm -hmm. you know, interoception of course, being an attention to what's going on with, on the surface of, and within the confines of our skin, as opposed yeah. to the ex outside world, mm -hmm. um, drawing our attention to anything inside us or outside us involves forebrain function, yeah. prefrontal cortex, presumably, mm -hmm. and, and other things. Typically eyes are closed. Mm -hmm. Typically it's relaxing. Yeah. So there are a lot of variables that could be feeding into right. a number of different effects. Yeah. But, but as a neuroscientist, mm -hmm. what do you think is going on that just that this period of kind of an self-induced, somewhat unusual state, mm -hmm. what do you think is going on in terms of network behavior and, um, networks within the brain that it can have these long-term effects because yeah. we got to some of the ones relate downstream of exercise. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think there's so much evidence. I know there's so much evidence that meditation is beneficial. Yes. How do you think it's working or what, it, what do you think it's doing? Yeah. I think that one of the most important things that gets um, worked when we are doing a simple 10 minute or 12 minute body scan um, meditation regularly, this 10 minutes a day, 12 minutes a day, is um, the habit building and the practice of focusing on the present moment. I think that is very hard for us modern humans to do because I'm worrying about the thing that's due uh, um, at the end of the week that, that I, need, I need to do and how many hours am I going to have to be able to do that. Or I'm worried about, you know, whatever, the email that wasn't as polite as it should be that I sent and what were the reper repercussions for that. Instead of focusing on this moment, which is fun. I get to talk to you. Uh, it's a beautiful day outside. It's, uh, um, I'm feeling good right at this moment. And I think that those, all of the meditative pra practices um, that, I, I've, that I've done, and this one also, um, whether you know it or not, is getting you to focus on, on this moment. And I think it's even more important in this day and age 
where anxiety levels and the next variant might come out and what, what are the repercussions there. And I have a mother who's older and she's more susceptible to it and there's a war and, and what's going to happen there. Um, those are all future possibilities. And, and we should be worried about that. that. That is a possibility. You need to plan for that. But you also need to focus on this moment right now. I'm, I'm healthy. I could breathe. I get to have this interesting conversation right in this moment. If I start thinking about other things, then it takes away from this moment. Um, do I know what circuits are being are involved? Not exactly. That is not my area. I think there are some studies that have, have focused on that, that mo present moment kind of uh, activity. But that is what I think is most important about, about the practice of meditation, or one of the important things that calms us down. Because if you know how to do that, that gives you this powerful tool for the rest of your day. You're not locked into that fearful future thinking that so many of us have, or that, that, that uh, just reliving of the terrible past, but you could enjoy, enjoy the present moment. Yeah, I, that really resonates. I think that um, going back to the earlier part of our conversation, you know, this, the hippocampus has this incredible storage capacity and ability to set context about past, present, and future. Yeah. And that's a beautiful thing mm -hmm. because as much as I like to think he had some semblance of a healthy life, none of us want to be HM. Right. None of us want to be in the position of not being able to form new memories and have mm -hmm. no context to the past or, right. or the present. Yeah. So we're grateful that, that we should all be grateful that our hippocampus uh, can draw from past, present, and future in various combinations. And we should support it through the mm -hmm. daily exercise and other uh, habits. Let's call them habits so that people make them habits that you've highlighted. But if we are not deliberately anchoring within past, present, and future according to what we need, mm -hmm. and we're just shuffling between past, present, and future, that is not a good way to live. No. It's not effective. No. It sounds like meditation can really help us um, go to the right stacks. You know, I guess people don't go to libraries in the, anymore. But in the, <laughs> but in the old days, you, would go, you right. need to go to the right location in the library. You actually can't get distracted by the, the books that you're interested in if you need to go uh, just yeah. reflexively, we need to go study a particular topic. Yes, so that's kind of yes. how I think about it. Yeah, it makes us more linear, perhaps, yeah. in our yeah. in our way of being. I think so, and it actually counteracts. You know, not that I'm against technology, but having our phones and being connected to every good and bad thing going along, going on in the world today, is incredibly distracting and and takes you away from the present moment virtually 24 hours a day. And so we have to work extra hard right now compared to in the 40s when we didn't have all this technology or at the same level. So um, yeah, it becomes uh, even more important practice, I think, for, for everyday life. Yeah, or even 10, 15 years ago, um, it felt like smartphones weren't as intrusive. Yeah. Uh, one final question mm -hmm. and, and maybe a, uh, a request. Okay. Um, as the new incoming dean of College of Letters and Sciences, <laughs> and, and I must say, I'm delighted, thrilled, actually, to hear that a lot of the practices that we've been discussing today and that you've pioneered are going to be incorporated into undergraduate education. Yeah. I I predict, and I'd be willing to wager that that will become a template for how mm -hmm. universities and non-university systems yeah. should function. Because mm -hmm. if indeed, the, and it, it is true that there's this incredible relationship between physical movement and mental deliberate practices and performance, yeah. any corporation, school, household would be crazy, yeah. would be self, you know, self limiting and even self destructive to not incorporate those. Yeah. So I'm so happy that you're going to do this and collect data. Please, yeah. please, we'll have to touch back with you yes. and, and hear uh, what what comes of that. But one of the, the main things that I hear so much about today are mm. issues with attention. Mm. And we haven't talked about attention. We've mainly been talking about memory and yes. cognition. Yes. But you know a lot about attention. Mm -hmm. And and here I'm not being disparaging. I think people have done what I'm about to say as a as a consequence of need and lack of other resources. There's an immense amount of Adderall use, Ritalin use, Modafinil use. And caffeine abuse. Now, I happen mm -hmm. to like caffeine. Mm -hmm. I, I don't use the other compounds I described. But it's just incredible to me how yeah. the, the data on this are, a colleague of mine at Stanford claims that you know something like 
two thirds or more of college students use these without prescription mm. for ADHD. Yeah. Uh, what can we expect in terms of the effects of regular exercise on attention? And are there any other things besides exercise and meditation that you would like to see people do in terms of trying to increase their powers of attention? Because yeah. I think the ability to attend to focus mm -hmm. and attend yeah. is really the distinguishing feature between those that will succeed in any endeavor yeah. and those that won't. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's a scary thing for a lot of people to hear because yeah. a lot of people think they have ADHD. They right. may, they may not, but I bet that a number of students at both Stanford and NYU feel challenged yeah. with holding their attention Absolutely. to the thing that they need to hold their attention yeah. to. Yeah, yeah. So I would say the top three uh, tools that everybody right this minute today can use to up their capacity to attend where they want to uh, include exercise for the reasons we've talked about. It has a direct effect on functioning of the prefrontal cortex. Meditation also, clear clinical studies showing improved ability to, to focus and, and particularly focus on the present moment. Um, and the third has to be sleep. So sleep is, you, you can't, it's, out of the three, it is the most physiological. I mean, I could I could live my whole life without meditating one minute. Could I could I survive without sleep? No, n none of us could. So it's 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 more basic physiological, but it is so important for all core cognitive functions, uh, uh, including attention, including creativity, including uh, um, just you know, uh, uh, just good, good, basic brain, brain function. Um, that is why it's, you know, it's so critical to get that information, that basic neuroscience information into the heads of these students that are trying their best to show us how their brain work, but, but being hampered because they're not moving enough. They're not meditating and um, there's all these distracting things that they include in their lives some of which a little bit is is good but you know 24 hours a day on your phone and and LinkedIn um, not LinkedIn but but linked to your phone um, is damaging to your attention so exercise meditation sleep can help you learn retain and perform better than if you do not have these three things in your life. Wonderful. Uh, music to my ears. <laughs> and also um, either very low cost or zero cost, right. considering that the exercise doesn't require a class. Right. One could do use the uh, freely av available resource of gravity right. to <laughs> right. uh, to do jumping jacks or burpees or yes. push-ups or whatever, yeah. or sit-ups or all of those. And don't forget YouTube, the freely accessible millions of YouTube videos if you don't want to do your jumping jacks by yourself, I always say this, you know, I, I talk about breath meditation in, um, for my book, Good Anxiety. And, you know, if, if you don't like the one that I suggest, there's only about a million more on YouTube with, with ratings from one star to five stars. So um, use that resource. It is a wonderful resource. And you are an amazing resource. Uh, uh, Wendy, thank you so much for coming here today to have this discussion and share your knowledge about not just existing data, but new data mm -hmm. coming, coming out soon. And for your leadership in the university system, for your leadership in public education, for the decades of important work on memory and neural circuitry, which uh, we got to learn about today as well. Thank you ever so much. Thank you, Andrew. Fun conversation. Thank you for joining me today for my discussion about learning and memory and how to get better at learning and remembering with Dr. Wendy Suzuki. If you'd like to learn more about Dr. Suzuki's work, you can go to wendysuzuki.com. There you will also find titles and links to her popular books, as well as her social media handles. We've also placed those in the show note captions. If you're learning from and or enjoying this podcast, please subscribe to us on YouTube. That's a terrific zero cost way to support us. In addition, please subscribe to the podcast on Spotify and or Apple. And on both Spotify and Apple, you can leave us up to a five-star review. If you have suggestions about guests or topics that you'd like us to cover on the Huberman Lab podcast, or you'd like to give us feedback of any kind, please leave that in the comments section on YouTube. That's the best place to give us feedback. Please also check out the sponsors mentioned at the beginning of today's episode. That's the best way to support this podcast. 
We also have a Patreon. It's patreon.com slash Andrew Huberman. And there you can support the podcast at any level that you like. On many episodes of the Huberman Lab podcast, we discuss supplements. While supplements are certainly not necessary for everybody, many people derive tremendous benefit from them for things like accelerating the transition into sleep and getting better, deeper sleep, as well as enhancing focus and learning and other aspects of human performance and health. We're excited to announce that we've partnered with Momentus Supplements. The reason we partnered with Momentus is several fold. First of all, we wanted to have one location where Huberman Lab podcast listeners could go in order to find all the supplements that we talk about and to find those in a form where they could systematically try one or the other. This is a real issue in the supplement industry. A lot of supplement brands out there combine different ingredients in ways that don't really allow you to pinpoint exactly what you need and what you don't need. So getting supplements that have low doses or just the minimal effective dose of particular ingredients and being able to mix and match those ingredients yourself and really establish what's best for you is really key. In addition, we came to realize that a lot of our listeners want supplements, but they reside outside of the United States. So we're pleased to tell you that Momenta ships both within the US and internationally. And of course, Momenta supplements are of the very highest quality ingredients and the precision of the amounts of those ingredients is tightly regulated. If you're interested in Momentus supplements, the catalog of supplements related to the Huberman Lab podcast are growing all the time. A good number of them are already there. You can go to livemomentus.com slash Huberman in order to find them. And there will be additional supplements added to that site as we go forward. If you're not already following Huberman Lab on Twitter and Instagram, I post neuroscience and other science-related information and tools on a regular basis. Some of that information overlaps with the content of the Huberman Lab podcast but a lot of it is distinct from the information contained on the Huberman Lab podcast. So again, that's Huberman Lab on Instagram and Huberman Lab on Twitter. We also have a neural network newsletter. What that is, is a monthly newsletter in which I distill critical points from different podcast episodes, provide links to useful resources. If you wanna sign up for that newsletter, I should mention it is zero cost and we do not share your email with anybody. And we have a very clear privacy policy posted at hubermanlab.com. Just go to hubermanlab.com click on the menu, you'll see the neural network newsletter. You can also look at examples of newsletters without having to sign up to make sure that you actually do want to sign up. But if you are interested, the sign up is there very easy and you can receive our monthly newsletter. So once again, thank you for joining me today for our voyage into the neuroscience of learning and memory and tools to get better at learning and memory. And as always, thank you for your interest in science. 